As interesting as the hydrogen atom is, we really want to gain some insight into atomic structure for the heavier atoms as well. There are over a hundred other elements that we're also concerned with on the periodic table. As we move to heavier atoms, we're going to start have to having to use multiple subshells in most cases. And the full description of occupied subshells and the number of electrons within them in an atom is called its electron configuration. The configuration of electrons in the rooms of the building, if you like to continue that metaphor. And to describe an electron configuration, we list those subshells and their numbers of electrons from lowest to highest energy. So the number of electrons is listed as a superscript and the subshell label, including the principal quantum number, is listed just as a number followed by a letter to represent the value of L. So this will have that N value plus S, P, D, F, etc. And each subshell will be listed just in a string of letters and numbers. Now, there's another way to represent electron configuration in diagram form that more clearly shows the energies of the subshells with respect to one another. And we'll refer to this as an energy level diagram, orbital energy diagram. We've played around with these a little bit already. Plotting energy on the y-axis and plotting the subshell energy levels as horizontal lines. So for example, for the hydrogen atom in its ground state, there is one electron occupying the lowest energy 1s orbital, and we can list it right here as a dot or sometimes as an up or down arrow to indicate spin. And here, I've drawn the 2p subshell as a single line. You'll often see this drawn as three lines to indicate the three distinct orbitals within that subshell. So you'll see this representation. Make sure you understand what you're looking at. It plots the relative energies of the various subshells and quite often the number of orbitals within each subshell as well. Before we get into the nitty gritty of describing electron configurations and deducing electron configurations, one thing I want to point out is that the periodic table reflects how we fill the atomic orbital scaffold. As we fill, we add electrons from the lowest energy orbitals up, and as we do that, we fill, for example, the 1s orbital first, that gets us to helium, the 2s orbital next, that gets us to beryllium, and what we can see here is that all of the elements in these first two groups are filling up that s subshell, so they're what we call the s block. And then we move over here, now we're filling up the p subshell, and you can see that with P1, P2, P3, P4. This is called the P block from group 3A or group 13 through group 18. When we finally get to a value of N where we can have a D subshell at N equals 3, we start filling up that 3D, 4D, 5D subshell. And as we're filling those D orbitals, we're in what's called the D block. And when we're finally to the point where we can have an F subshell at N equals 4, we start filling up those F orbitals down here at the lanthanides and actinides. And this is called the F block. The number of elements in each block, particularly as we look left to right, reflects the capacity of that subshell for electrons. There are six spots for electrons in the P subshell, and sure enough, there are six elements from left to right across the P block. That's not a coincidence. There are two spots for electrons in an S subshell and two columns in the S block. Again, not a coincidence. For the first 20 elements, electron configurations follow a very clear pattern because the scaffold of atomic orbital energies doesn't change that much, at least in a relative sense, the ordering of these energies remains the same. We start by filling the 1s subshell, the 2s is next in energy, followed by the 2p, and then the 3s, and then the 3p, and then the 4s. When the d subshells come into the conversation, this gets a little bit complicated. So the most reliable rule for writing electron configurations really stops at Z equals 20, stops at calcium, and it's called the Madelung rule after its inventor or discoverer, Madelung. And we fill from the bottom up, and this is a manifestation of the Aufbau principle, which has its dedicated slide here in a couple of slides. And this is a mnemonic you may have seen before. If we list the subshells in columns, 1s, 2s, 3s, 4s, 2p, 3p, and draw diagonal lines like this, we get the listing of orbitals from lowest to highest energy. 1s, 2s, 2p, 
3s, 3p, 4s, etc. And the Aufbau principle we've seen already, this slide is just dedicated to it, it directs us to fill subshells from the lowest to the highest energy. And we represent those up and down spin electrons as we fill as up and down arrows. And once we've got a pair of up and down arrows in a particular orbital, we're done filling electrons in that orbital due to the Pauli exclusion principle. So each orbital, which is associated with three quantum numbers, principle, orbital, and magnetic in L and M sub L can hold a maximum of two electrons. So this slide shows you some examples of electron configurations for the first five elements. Hydrogen is 1s1. We add an electron, we get to 1s2. That subshell is full. For lithium, 1s2, 2s1. Beryllium, 1s2, 2s2. And for boron, now the 2s subshell is full, and we have to add an electron to the 2p subshell to get to 2p1. When we get to those 2p subshells, now we've got degenerate orbitals, three different orbitals into which we could add electrons. And Hund's rule tells us to add electrons to keep them unpaired as long as we possibly can. Another way to put this is that we want to maximize the electron spin, keep those spins parallel and pointing in the same direction as long as we can. So for example, after boron, when we get to carbon, we add a second electron to the 2p subshell, we don't pair it up with the first electron. We add it parallel in a different orbital within the 2p subshell. Pairing the electrons, remember, would result in greater electron-electron repulsion since they would be associated with the same probability distribution over space and occupying the same regions of space. Putting the electrons in different orbitals gives them different spatial distributions and thus electron-electron repulsion is reduced. For nitrogen, we continue that idea. We add that third electron into the remaining unfilled orbital to create three parallel spin electrons. For oxygen, we have no choice but to pair up, so we have to put a downspin electron in one of the three orbitals, doesn't matter which one. Fluorine, we pair up again, and finally at neon, all of the electrons in the 2p subshell are paired, and that subshell, and indeed the n equals 2 shell entirely, is completely full. One last important distinction we need to make is between core and valence electrons. Core electrons occupy the inner shells, the lower floors of the building, if you will. And the lower floors of the building are not where the action is happening. Those electrons are stable, they're unreactive, they tend to follow the nucleus around. Electrons in the outermost shell, the outer layer of the onion, the top floor of the building, are called valence electrons. And this is really where the action is at. Valence electrons are engaged in bonding. They can be given away in redox processes. The valence shell can accept electrons if an atom is being reduced. And so the valence shell is, is very important. And its distinction is very important. Because the core electrons are not that important, we often package them up in the corresponding noble or idea or in the corresponding noble or inert gas configuration, helium in square brackets, neon in square brackets, etc. So for example, carbon has the configuration 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. But 1s2 is the configuration of helium, and that's the core of carbon, right? N equals 1 is a core shell for carbon. So another way to write this configuration is with helium in square brackets, this implies 1s2, and then just the valence electrons, which include those in the 2s subshell. Remember, this is the second floor of the building. The outermost layer is n equals 2. So the 2s2 electrons are valence electrons, and the 2p2 electrons, of course, are also valence electrons. At this point, we have all the analytical tools we need to write electron configurations out to calcium. When we get to the transition metals, things get a little complicated, and the next video is going to kind of complicate this picture for the transition metals. If you're only asked to write electron configurations through calcium or for the main group elements, you can skip the next video. But if you want to learn more about why the transition metals behave the way they do in terms of electron configuration, for example, you've heard about the exceptions that appear in the transition series, I encourage you to watch the next video, which tries to put this on a solid foundation 
that doesn't require you to memorize the anomalous electron configurations, but shows you that there is an underlying pattern to electron configurations in the transition series if you look at things the right way.